Well, good afternoon, everybody, and welcome along to the penultimate Landlord Lens of 2021. If you're new um, to our broadcast, a very warm welcome uh, to you. Um, and as always, uh, we're going to be joined by uh, NRLA CEO Ben Beadle to discuss the trending topics for landlords. Just to give you a quick idea of the format on Property Tribes, um, of which I'm the co-founder, uh, we have a trending topic silo. It's a little algorithm that sorts all the uh, topics um, in, in what's trending in terms of landlords viewing, landlords responding, um, levels of engagement, and it updates every three hours. So when Ben and I came up uh, with the landlord lens, we wanted it to be very, very up to date and cutting edge, literally like a barometer uh, for landlords and what's on their minds. Isn't that right, Ben? Absolutely. And there's a lot on your minds at the moment. And there's a lot on my mind. <laughs> We've got a lot to get through, I think. We have. We've got a very full agenda. Um, well, first of all, Ben, I thought we, we'd just uh, break the format very slightly just to talk about actual trending topics at the NRLA, because you've had uh, concerns about the ending of furlough uh, and the uh, cutting of benefit support, creating a kind of cliff edge for both renters and landlords. This is a real concern, isn't it? It's not a problem that's just going to go away because everything's coming back to normal. I mean, that's right. Uh, it is a concern. And, you know, it's a concern that will affect all of us. Um, why should landlords be bothered about, uh, you know, the, the, the end of support? Obviously, it will minimise the amount of rent that is available to be collected. So what we have at the moment is the end of uh, uh, furlough. We have the end of the £20 um, uplift on universal credit. We also have shorter notice periods, which will come as a relief uh, to some landlords that have difficulty. Um, uh, but if you put all of those things, you know, in, in the mix, um, it is a storm of its, of its own making. And uh, I spoke with the Housing Minister, Chris Pincher, uh, last week about this very subject. Um, and they understand obviously the you know the uh, the problem that this uh, is going to cause um and from my perspective i don't want landlords to be the bogeyman here and the point that i raised to him is that landlords are having to choose between uh, evicting their tenant which really nobody wants or swinging debts um well you know that's like choosing your method of torture as far as i'm concerned uh, and i just think that this is a really avoidable situation and the, the, if you compare this, uh, the level of debt in the private rented sector to other areas, such as either mortgages or the social sector, both of those have reset back to pre-pandemic levels, according to the government's own figures. But again, according to the government's own figures, the private rented sector has actually tripled. And so it would seem to me that the withdrawal of the support mechanisms um, are probably not well timed you know, if we bear in mind that um there's been no real support for landlords who are struggling actually all this decision all, all this decision will mean is that it, it it puts pressure back on the landlord tenant relationship um which is you know not what we want to see frankly mm, indeed uh, you know landlords as we know have struggled uh, during covid uh, as much as tenants and i, I know you were in favour of a kind of phasing out of these these measures to, uh, you know, to stop this actual this actual cliff edge. And it, it's interesting that you you mentioned that you've spoken to uh, one of the housing ministers, Chris Pincher. I believe that he uh, survived the cabinet yes. reshuffle <laughs> because we know that we now have a new uh, housing secretary, uh, Michael Gove. Uh, I've lost track of what number he is because they change on such a regular basis. Um, I just wondered, Ben, do you have any thoughts on Michael Gove, um, you know, how he's going to look at the private rented sector? Is he going to be more favourable towards landlords? I don't think he'd give a stuff, um, actually, is my honest truth. I think um, that the levelling up uh, agenda, which is being now channeled through the old MHCLG, I think he will be interested in big, bigger ticket items, cladding, uh, building safety, uh, and supply. 
um, uh, I, I think he will look at the work, um, and we might touch on this a little bit later actually, but there's been a lot of work going on over the summer about rental reform and see actually things are trucking along. Yeah, there's a very clear direction of travel. We've, we've covered this on um, on, on this uh, webinar in, in the past around redress, landlord registration, security of tenure, end of section 21, yada, yada, yada. That work is all taking place and the NRLA have been involved in all of the ministerial led um, working groups. That was actually with Eddie Hughes, uh, who's funder Chris Pincher. So I think that someone like Gove, and this, uh, you know, if you listen to his speech yesterday, he didn't really mention the private rented sector. Um, uh, so I, I, I think he's going to be looking at some very headline issues within housing uh, and, and take the view that the, the work on the private rented sector um, is trucking along. Uh, we are due an autumn uh, white paper. Um, I suspect um, it, it may have a, a, a tinge of tinsel, this uh, white paper, um, and maybe even a touch of snow and, and, and frost. I don't think it is going to be autumn. Uh, there is still one more, at least one more um, uh, round table on um, property standards uh, to, be, to be held. Um, so I, I, I think to answer your question, I, I, th I think things are trucking along as far as that is concerned, and he will be looking at leveling up from a, a you know um, uh, a macro level rather than a, a detail level of what the private rented sector is doing. That's interesting. Um, he does have something of a voting history in in favour of, of landlords, which you can view on Property Tribes. It's very right. helpfully been collated by one of our members, but. We noticed that the department uh, had a name change as well, and it's been changed to the Department for Leveling Up Housing and Communities. Um, ben, it's very interesting that housing comes second um, when it's such a in, in in the name of the new department. When it is such a incredible economic powerhouse for the UK, and you know we we are experiencing the fallout of all the all the COVID lockdown measures. Um, it, it's interesting that they, they put it second to to levelling up. Um, I don't know what you think about that. Well, I, I, I think it means that they are serious about levelling up and all that it entails. Um, uh, I think the reason they put it within housing is because housing has a huge part to play in terms of addressing you know the various uh, imbalances that that kind of exist within the sector, um, and I think the focus on you know he, he in previous speeches as you you've identified on on PT is that he has spoken in the past about increasing uh, the supply of homes available, and we're all in agreement that you know that you, know, you can slice and, uh, and dice the the private rented sector and squeeze it a little bit but at the end of the day you haven't really got a great deal that's coming in to replace it so i think you know the leveling up agenda will not just be about supply but it will also be um uh, and pincher mentioned this to me last week um it will also be about um turning generation rent into generation buy. Mm. And I think that will have an interesting dynamic on the private rented sector. Um, you know, as we were discussing before we came on, you know, the the, the ability to borrow money, um, you know, it costs literally oh, hardly anything. And there's some great deals about, as we will talk about later. So I, I think, you know, bridging that gap into home ownership is an area that Gove will absolutely focus on. It will have different impacts on the on the private rented sector. Doesn't mean that the private rented sector won't have a significant part to play. Um, and I suspect it might be helpful from the point of view of timeframes when it comes to regulation of the private rented sector, i.e., I think they're going to do other things before they carry on their manifesto pledges. Time will tell. Indeed, well, there's my prediction. Move on, let's move on to uh, the trending topics that we've uh, selected to discuss in this landlord lens. Um, and the first one, just to touch on briefly, briefly really, is that um, a, a week uh, fr a week ago Friday was the 25th anniversary of the buy to let mortgage. And you may have seen some coverage uh, in the Telegraph. I was fortunate enough to be uh, featured as a landlord in there. Um, I actually started my landlord career in 1992, 
uh, when I rented out a studio flat in London that I couldn't sell because it had a defective lease on it. Um, but as I always say, I've been a portfolio landlord since 2004. And it was it was really interesting to take part in that article and discuss, um, you know, how the buy to let mortgage has, uh, you know, revolutionized housing uh, in, in the UK um, and also how it's helped what I would call the man on the street to create wealth through property, which was previously the d domain of, of the wealthy. So um, happy 25th anniversary, buy to let. What do you say, Ben? I, I say, um, you know, it, it's fabulous. It's been genuinely fabulous. I mean, it's posed different challenges, doesn't it? You know, we're talking about different ways of regulating the sector. But actually, if you think about, you know, you can, you can be very dismissive of the private rented sector and all it brings, but actually what it's done is it's genuinely made homes available for people. Yes, you know, there's some rough ones around the, the edges that will benefit from greater regulation, but it, it's provided much needed um, uh, accommodation and generally it's done it quickly. It's done it um, uh, uh, in a way um, that makes these homes available to people that need it. And it's bridged uh, a significant gap of where other areas, frankly, have, have really uh, failed. So, you know, we can be very, and I'm not critical of the private rented sector, others are critical of the private rented sector and see social housing as being the absolute panacea to all of our ills. Um, uh, I say be careful what you wish for um, because the grass is not always greener on the other side and I think you know um, uh, buy to let is standing the test of time and it's done you know it's enabled people to invest and, and provision for their pension as well as uh, make much needed homes uh, available to people good job I say Yes, win, win, win for, for everybody involved, I think. It is interesting, I think the, the private rented sector, one thing that we perhaps don't shout about enough is, is the, the, the choice it gives people, um, because we're not just talking two or three bed family homes and one or two bed apartments that people like to rent. Um, I have a, a friend who is extremely wealthy, uh, a business owner, and he chooses to rent, and he rents a, a, a five-star barn conversion. So, you know, we we shouldn't really, you know, just keep saying that it's for people that can't afford to do anything else. It it it, it provides, you know, to, for a lot of different people's needs, doesn't it? It does, and you know, people will choose to be in the private rented sector, as your um, as your mate has uh, attested to. Mm -hmm. So. Yeah. Yeah, I, I think I think the issue on the PRS is that it's actually over that 25 years, it's it's being lent on and asked to do things it probably wasn't um, it envisaged it it would do, but you know the private rented sector is a really agile uh, uh, and responsive place wow. that um, you know doesn't sit around talking about homes, it provides them. Um, and, and that's why it exceeds uh, in size wise the social housing uh, uh, sector. And, you know, I, I think it really has delivered much needed uh, homes. So, you know, you, you, you can you, you can sit on the sidelines and, and criticize and say it's not regulated enough. It's not this. It's not that. Well, as NRLA research showed, you know, um, over the summer, 168 pieces of, of legislation that landlords need to comply with. We have plenty of regulation in the private rented sector. What we have is a, a, a crisis of enforcement um, mm -hmm. and there are no signs that that is going to get better. So it, it enables those sort of horror stories at the edges to really come to the fore where then everybody looks at the PRS as, as being the Wild West. And mm -hmm. I don't think that is the case. I think you know, there's plenty of regulation out there to bring people to book and to do it properly. And as good landlords, we have nothing to worry about from that happening. Um, but we mustn't tarnish one sector uh, with a, a particular colour, uh, because that that's very far from the truth. Mm, I agree 100%. Let's move on to um, our next trending topic then, and I've actually kind of done this as an umbrella topic, uh, Ben, because we've actually had quite a few trending threads on the topic of taxation. Um, we've heard that Labour are hinting to further tax buy to let. Uh, some property tribes members think that there's going to be some kind of wealth tax introduced on um, multiple properties if you own more than one home. 
Uh, some Property Tribes members think that the limited company loophole may be closed down. Um, and, you know, it, it's always a tax is such an important part of being a landlord and getting the right ta tax structure, etc. But I think a lot of landlords, are, certainly the, the, the Property Tribes community, they, they don't think that we've seen the end of landlord taxation. And, and that is concerning. Yeah, well, yeah I, I mean, look, let's... <laughs> Let's look at where we are. And we saw uh, Rishi Sunak talking um, uh, yesterday at the Tory party conference about the, the direction of travel. Um, I, I think I think readers are probably right. Yeah, I think we've got a bit more pain um, uh, to come, um, which is why I've commissioned a piece of research over the summer um, uh, with LSE that looks at the contribution landlords make to society and the treasury, frankly, because I want to be um, you know, talking about the the, the you know, I haven't seen the report yet, but you know, in my in my dreams, I'm I'm thinking you know, landlord buys a property and they they contribute x x amount pounds uh, uh, more. That's what I'm hoping it's going to say anyway. I, I may have a, a shock when I get the, get the report, but clearly, you know, we're in the we're up to our neck in it at the moment and all of the various expenditure that we've seen over these past 18 months will have to be paid for um and you know we've seen uh, comments that uh um you know the labor party have a particular way of dealing with it um uh, so we hope they will never get into power um uh but obviously everyone's going to have to make their contribution what we will be arguing uh, is that landlords already make a very significant contribution uh, mm. one of the very few industries uh, to pay tax on their revenue rather than their profits uh, if you are an individual and i think the thing to remember is um i know it's sometimes difficult to tell the difference um uh, but uh, you know a lot of uh, landlords will be core Tory uh, voters and so they will have to tread a very difficult line between winning those red wall votes um, and alienating um, uh, long-standing people uh, to whom you know property ownership is something to be encouraged and you know a job job well done so mm -hmm. yeah I think it is going to be very tricky if I was to put money on it um, uh, I don't think we've quite seen the last of capital gains tax would be would be my gut reaction. But who knows what we're going to see in the in the spending review in the, in a few weeks time. Well, I'm very interested to uh, hear that you've commissioned that report. Um, and obviously, we will share that with, with the property tribes community when it's ready. But I, I think that's going to provide some very interesting uh, data, Ben. So I, I shall be looking forward to seeing the, the outcome of that. Um, the other thing on tax was uh, we had a thread posted that there is a capital gains tax uh, penalty waiting to bite landlords. Um, and that is something that landlords may not be aware of, which I, I think is worth always mm. reiterating. Um, and that is that when you dispose of, of a buy to let property, you not only have to um, calculate your capital gain tax within 30 days but you also have to pay it within 30 days and you do that via the government gateway site so you will need uh, a government gateway pass word um, and, and account if you're going to be in property and and buying and selling properties uh, interesting Ben because I sold um, a four bed house in Manchester, Manchester about three weeks ago um, I use the government uh, capital gains cal calculator to work out my capital gain liability. Then I just logged on to my government gateway and paid my capital gain liability. And I have to say, I actually found it relatively uh, simple, which is good for a, a government thing. Um, but it's, it's these kind of things that, that can bite landlords. Um, I was talking to a gentleman that's got um, 10 properties in Glasgow and he said oh, I'm going to expand in Scotland and, and he wasn't aware that rent controls are being brought yeah. in um, and I think it's these little nuances that landlords they have to be informed and aware of these things because they can come back um, and bite.
Yeah, I mean, you, you know, we've spoken about due diligence many a, uh, on many of a, ca- a occasion, and um, yeah, you know, Scotland's a whole different ball game, isn't it? Frankly, I'm glad I'm not a landlord up there. Um, uh, uh, but yes, uh, I too use the um, uh, having uh, disposed of a property earlier this year, the uh, and complied with the 30 day uh, uh, rule. Very easy to take your money. That's what I say. <laughs> <laughs> Excellent. Well, we're we're moving on to another trending topic now, um, and and this is a very serious one. Um, We had a thread on Property Tribes um, where a a landlord came on and said that his tenant had claimed that uh, the electrician he sent round to the rental property had assaulted the tenant's daughter who was alone in the property, a sexual uh, assault. Uh, this landlord came on and said, "What do I do? Uh, do I get involved? Uh, you know." And there was there was a lot of people saying, "Actually, it's nothing to do with you. The police should be involved. The tenant should report this guy to the police." And others were saying, "Actually, it is something to do with you. You sent the guy round there." Um, it, ben, it's a really really curly topic, isn't it? It's it's a hard hard to know, uh, you know, what the best course of action is in this situation. It, it it really is obviously a, a really wretched situation to be in. I think um, I, I can't honestly pretend that I, uh, I've had the experience of being in this poor landlord's shoes. Um, mm-hmm. But I think I think a couple of things. I think um, you know we have to be careful about the individuals that we send down send round to look after our properties, both from a, a you know insurance and. Uh, a suitability to do the, uh, the 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 work, but um, you know, as, assuming we are uh, have taken reasonable steps to make sure that the individual is kind of you know appropriate to do the work, um, I think I'd probably be passing the buck um, uh, if I was honest uh, about it and saying um, you know supporting the tenant as far as I am. I'm able to obviously not sending that individual uh, background or any anybody to do with that uh, uh, company uh, background again, but but um, you know I think it is a matter for them to to report to the police because you know hearsay in this you know in this instance is not terribly helpful, is it? You know one word against uh, against another. Um, I, I think we have to let the authorities uh, work that out and be as helpful to the authorities um, when they check it out as possible. I do think that this is one of those instances where the um, NRLA advice line um, comes into play. I, I call it uh, my my phone a friend for landlords. <laughs> um, and I've, I've been to NRLA HQ and I've spoken to the uh, the people that man the phone lines there and they are incredibly knowledgeable. I don't think there's one landlord scenario that they haven't encountered um, and that they're such a useful resource for landlords and and this is you know what I'm a member of the NRLA and have been for many many years um, I think the advice line is something that that we should highlight more yeah I mean we I mean I'm very lucky we've got some fabulous colleagues on that advice line it's one of the things that we've expanded as a result of the merger so we believe it or not got over 30 individuals um, uh, that that man or woman uh, the 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 phones um, uh, a lot of them are landlords they come from different backgrounds but um, we have a, a a tremendous demand on our services in fact yesterday we received uh, so we we normally receive somewhere between two and two and a half thousand calls a week um, and yesterday I think we received 800 calls in the day uh, all to do with um, extended notice periods you know what we discussed at the at the outset so I, you know, I, it wouldn't surprise me if there's been some people holding back um, uh, before they issue uh, uh, notices to take obviously advantage of the of the lower periods but yeah you're absolutely right Vanessa it's um, uh, it, it really is someone put on trip uh, trip advisor the uh, trust pilot the other day that the NRLA is my life jacket in a stormy sea um, and I thought that was a really good analogy because um, you know we're, we're there six days a week to be able to answer even the most mundane or difficult question when it comes to advice on managing your property so uh, yes glad glad you like it I do and Ben I know you'll agree with me when I say if, if you have a question ask it 
don't, don't be afraid um, that there's no such thing as a silly question if you don't know the answer. The fact that you're asking it, you know, means your your mind is open, you want to learn, you want to be better. That's to be commended. Um, so that's what Property Tribes is for. That is what the NRLA helpline is for. We, we have community resources to, to help you get your questions answered. And indeed, we have uh, questions on uh, this webinar. So feel free to drop them in the chat if you've got any comments or questions about the topics that we have um, talked about. How would you handle it if your tenant reported that the electrician you sent round had, had sexually assaulted their daughter? How would you handle it? We'd, we'd love to hear your views. Um, we're moving on now to another trending topic, uh, Ben. Utilities. Um, yeah. <laughs> we're wondering what the next uh, shortage and crisis is going to be, actually, aren't we? Um, it seems to be a new one every week, but uh, we've, we've had a couple of uh, trending topics uh, around this popping up on Property Tribes. Um, the first one was uh, somebody concerned that electric vehicles were going to be a threat to HMOs. They're saying if you've got four, five, six tenants in an HMO that all move to electric vehicles, how are they all going to charge their cars? Uh, what impact is that going to have on the uh, on the uh, utilities bill? Um, and obviously, we've also got rising costs uh, of utilities, which does you know, mainly affect HMOs uh, and possibly holiday lets. Um, and one landlord reporting that his energy bill will be going up by over £2,000 a year. Uh, very hard for landlords to absorb these these costs in, into their rents. Um, the margins haven't been great over the last few years. Um, it, it's a, another tricky situation for landlords to navigate, isn't it? Yeah, I mean, it, it is. And, um, you yeah, know, the reality is landlords won't won't absorb them it's as simple as that so um you know for the for the individual that has got bills included within within their hmos they will probably be looking at um i don't know if it's individual rooms or let as a whole property or or, or what but presumably they will be looking at uh, increasing their rents to you know to if they're able to 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 cater for that um uh, and i think the the the, the point about the electric charging is a really really interesting one so uh, so my mother has bought an electric car um uh, and she's absolutely beside herself at the moment because i've got a petrol car um and uh, whizzing around looking at all the garages and, and basically uh, uh doing two fingers up at, at, at people but interestingly she's got one of these um uh, obviously self-charging unit but but linked with um so solar solar panels on the roof apparently so we know that as landlords, uh, I know my mother is is far more advanced than, than than I on these things. But we know as landlords that the direction of travel is going to be towards um, you know greater energy efficient homes. And uh, you know, you asked me, uh, you, you told me that point before we came on. And I, I you know, as you know, I'm a, a, I have a handful of HMOs. Um, hadn't even uh, crossed my mind about electric um, uh, uh, charging points. And interestingly, on the on the license that I have, I'm only required uh, to make one parking space available. Um, uh, so, uh, so as long as that doesn't change, I'm I'm kind of okay, I think. Uh, and I probably wouldn't balk at the idea of of eventually putting in some sort of electric uh, at the charging point. But these are the things that. As we as we move towards, you know, um, probably EPC rating C and above, um, uh, these are the things that we're going to have to start thinking about. Um, and I also think the fuel crisis is going to make people uh, think slightly differently about the type of car that they um, uh, that they that they acquire, particularly when they if they if they're due a change uh, soon. So yeah, lot, lots of lots lots of uh, uncertainty around this I would suggest. I agree I think also there there is perhaps an opportunity as well that if you are aware of this and you have HMO properties you might like to think about future proofing your HMOs by putting in an electric car charging point before other landlords kind of catch on and it, it may help um, you know decrease voids increase number of tenant applicants it at Ben, it's it's you know we don't know. It's very fluid at the moment, but I definitely think, and I well, I know there's been a huge spike of people looking at electric vehicles because of the yeah. fuel crisis. Um, and as you say, we we know that's the the direction of travel. So chance to future proof 
uh, a property uh, could be there if you choose I, to see it like that. I agree, Vanessa. The one thing I, I would like to see, though, is and uh, we've been doing a lot of research over the summer, so we've got a report coming out on the 21st of October, um, which is about um, uh, green, uh, the green agenda, how you can increase uh, the EPC rating of your property and what the um, uh, support mechanisms might look like for landlords because obviously we did have the green homes uh, grants um, uh, and we know the direction of travel is going to be towards greater energy efficient homes but we now need to start talking about the support that's made available to property owners, not just landlords, um, uh, because the private rented sector, although not the only one, uh, you know, is probably a good place um, to be able to increase, uh, uh, you know, the energy performance um, uh, and that, that drive to sort of being car carbon carbon neutral. So, and end of this month, we will have a report out with uh, Lacalis that is looking at this very subject and making some recommendations about the funding that needs to be made available to property owners and mm. some suggestions around if there is a cap and what we do with uh, properties that you just can't, you know, insulate or you can't mm. uh, whack a um external um uh, uh, wall uh, insulation on um we will have a stark choice between uh what we want to do with those properties you know do we want people to live in them um or do we want to just arbitrarily keep them empty uh, and uh, and worsen uh, the already uh, dearth of supply that we have in the private rented sector so um yes some more interesting reading coming your way <laughs> I think it would be really good exercise if you haven't already done so to uh, look at your portfolio and check all your EPC ratings. Mm -hmm. um, you, 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 as Ben said, uh, when the new legislation comes in, if, if indeed it does, because I, I'm not sure that it's uh, been fully ratified yet, Ben, but you're going to have to have C or above to let a property. Um, I've just been through that exercise myself, and fortunately, because I purchased mostly new build, um, I haven't got any properties uh, with uh, an EPC rating below that. But if you've got older properties, uh, you know, Victorian terraces, things like that, uh, they may uh, not have a high enough EPC rating to let them out. And then, as Ben says, you'll have some uh, decisions to make, whether you want to upgrade them, if indeed you can, um, or you may wish to sell them. Um, and, and that brings me very nicely onto our next topic, because we've had 99 replies to this trending topic. Who has sold up in the past year and why? Um, and, and I can put my hands up straight away. I mentioned earlier I sold a four bed house uh, in Manchester. Um, it had been what I would call a problem property since I purchased it in 2006. I had uh, very poor quality tenants, uh, voids, um, a lot of, of, of arrears, uh, damage. I had a tenant uh, paint the entire property bright pink, uh, every single room, um, and all sorts of other mysterious holes in the floor and the wall and the banisters and the garage door caved in. I mean, the list was endless. Cut a long story short, I, I had a, a property, uh, one of my flats in London. Um, the lease has declined below 80 years. Um, it's going to cost me 31000 to extend the lease. So I decided to sell the problem property to fund the lease extension of the good performing flat and I have to say that when I run all my numbers um, my, my stock in, in London uh, sorry but yeah my stock in London and my houses in the southeast have vastly outperformed uh, the mm -hmm. stock that I have in the north so it's very interesting uh, to know what is motivating landlords to sell up Ben I mean there's so many reasons now isn't there I mean th there are um, and I have to declare an interest here that I, I, I sold a property uh, earlier earlier this year um, uh, not because I was worried about the environment that we're operating in but uh, you know, uh, simply because it didn't really stack up for me uh, the, the the returns were not you know, they weren't hardly worth doing, but they, they're they not as interesting as, say, a, a, a HMO property. And, and I think, um, you know, what, certainly what we've seen from our, our research is that we do have landlords that are thinking quite strategically about their portfolios and, you know, whether to offload, as you have, you know, the problem ones. Yeah. Um, in, my, in my case, 
I'm so lucky. I had 13 years I had this studio. It'd been empty a week, pretty much. Um, uh, hardly any time at all. It was a great letter, uh, but the, the margins were becoming increasingly uh, slim. And um, f frankly, I thought I would I would get rid of it. And I think there, you know, our figures show that although some landlords are doing that, we're seeing consolidation in the market as well. So in our most recent research, broadly the same amount of people that had sold sold a property had acquired one. And so although you might have um, smaller portfolio owners who are either exiting or, or bringing down their, their, their portfolios, what we're seeing is there's still an appetite, but also an appetite from a, a younger type of landlord as well, uh, which I think is quite interesting. People that are not put off by the direction of travel on regulation that, that that either have missed the tax changes or are accepting of them or they're constructing things in a in a way that is you know um tax efficient shall we say um so i, I, I for me this is this is not panic stations this is taking a sensible look at your portfolio and saying frankly this one doesn't make me enough money or it's a pain in the backside and i'm going to get rid of it and mm -hmm. i'm going to you know use some of that money to extend the lease or bring my property up to a c or a b or or or, or whatever um and uh, i think there's a lot of that that's going on at the moment it is it is a hard decision to make uh to sell a property well i i've certainly found it it hard um you haven't I become emotionally it, attached, have you, Vanessa? Well, you do, and you, you you remember what it took to be able to 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 acquire that property all those years ago. But um, I think you you've given some very good reasons there why uh, landlords may consider selling up. Uh, you know, to perhaps invest that money in better performing assets, which leads me nicely on to one of our final little snippets um, from trending topics, uh, and that is that there's incredibly cheap money around. It yes. is quite staggering. And uh, it's, this is something that I mentioned in my, uh, my, my 25th anniversary of Buy to Let interview in The Telegraph, um, how landlords coming into the sector now have got access to incredible rates. And Ben, we, we often worry that we are a bit pessimistic uh, on the landlord lens, but we're only talking about what landlords are talking about, but it's really nice to end on some really positive news. And I've got two bits. Number one, that TMW have released a sub 1% buy to let mortgage. Um, there are caveats with it. There's a thread about it on Property Tribes. If you want to go and have a look, you need a slightly bigger deposit, DTC, uh, ETC. Um, but, you know, if you've got an underperforming property, you could release uh that any equity in it and grab some of this really really cheap money it's an amazing commodity in my opinion it is and you know the problem the slight problem with cheap money is if you haven't got your tax affairs kind of in order where you're reliant on um you know being able to offset the full amount that actually you know it, it, it it's almost a worse situation in a way because the money is so cheap you've got nothing to offset and that's that's certainly uh, it was certainly the case with my studio flat that I, I, I saw. That, that's because I've configured everything totally disastrously and absolutely hemorrhaging money on, on, on tax. But enough about me. Don't, don't, don't do it the way I did it. Um, uh, but money is cheap at the moment and, and, and that brings opportunities. And back to the point about levelling up as well, yeah. you know, it will enable people uh tenants to to get that foot on the on on the ladder with a uh, a limited amount of deposit now whether that creates a you know a whole um uh big bang like we saw in 2008 in a few years time uh hopefully i should be an old man and retired by then and not give a stuff but um it'd be interesting to see what happens it will there's so many things that uh, you know levers that are going to affect the market you know there is there is the threat of inflation i've seen quite a bit about that um in the news the last few days um obviously we've got the the fallout of, of covid uh brexit all these uh fuel and energy crisis uh you know it's very very uh uncharted waters as we said very turbulent times it's absolutely incredible how well the housing market has performed both in sales and in, in rentals I've, I've heard today that um rents have gone up again uh supply is uh you know diminished uh, and rents are up and there's multiple tenants for every property i relet uh, a one-bed flat in east london um 
last weekend, I had uh, I did it through a letting agent. He told me he had 17 applications um, and he did an open house viewing with six tenants. Uh, my rent was uh, 12.75 per calendar month, and the uh, one of the tenants who was uh, working in financial services in Canary Wharf uh, offered 13.25, and I took her single lady. So um, yeah, that's very positive as well. Uh, we've got these unprecedented circumstances where both the sales and the rental market are really, really hyperactive at the same time. It's very, very unusual, isn't it, Ben? It is, and uh, yeah, it does just go. To to, to sort of demonstrate the, you know, we spoke about 25 years of, of um, buy to let, you know, it's a hugely resilient sector, yeah. a, a sector that we are incredibly reliant upon. And, you know, I, you know, I, as we've said, you know, we've, we've each sold uh, properties this year, but that's not because we're, we're down on, you know, uh, on the, on the outlook. Actually, it's because we're taking, you know, a good hard look at our, at the, at the assets that we have and making an informed decision about you know how we're going to deploy that uh, uh, money and invest and I think um, you know uh, if anything you know we come I hope anyway that we you know we're coming out of Covid uh, into a very buoyant market and yes you know we have the backdrop of greater regulation but but frankly that's a byproduct of um, or a cost of doing business uh, and I, I still am a great believer that the uh, the rewards are there if you've got the stomach for it. Mm, totally agree. Well, beer's well, on you next time, Vanessa, by the way, if you've got 50 eh? quid. Beer's on you next time if you've got 50 quid over the asking price. Oh, excellent. <laughs> well, I, definitely, Ben. I will look forward to seeing you at the Property Investor Show. Indeed. Uh, I know you're going to be there. I'm going to be there. Tickets are free. It's the 15th and 16th of October. Uh, really, really good day out. Uh, so much learning, uh, ex exhibitions, seminars panel debates. I'm actually hosting a panel debate on one of my favourite topics, which is holiday lets. So uh, do look it up um, and get your free tickets and we'll see you there. Final, final piece of good news, because we like to end on a high here on the Landlord Lens. Um, making tax digital being postponed. Yeah. Um, I, I wasn't too, I, I, I was pretty much dreading this, to be honest. Um, I, I won't deny it. Tax makes my eyes glaze over. I don't profess to uh, understand it. I've always worked with an accountant and I just hand everything over to him and say, here you go, Amit, uh, you get on with this for me. Um, I, uh, making tax digital does give me the fear a little bit, Ben, um, because we're going to have to record our tax uh, quarterly we've got to do it by the government gateway um, it's not something I believe you can pass over to your accountant so um, it's good that it's been uh, deferred for another year to 2023 so we have a little bit of time to uh, get used to the idea of it and see how it's going to yeah. work I'm not so sure I'll ever get used to the idea of it if I'm honest with you uh, Vanessa but uh, putting off the pain for an extra year is uh, I'll take that for the moment yeah, it, I, I don't know. It might encourage me to to sell up completely. That's um, that's how much I'm dreading it. I don't like the sound of it at all. Um, okay. Uh, yeah, th those were our kind of trending topics that uh, we've covered now. Um, now we're going to jump to the questions and answers session. I'd like to invite the event organizer Maria uh, from the NRLA to jump back on the call with us. Uh, she's been in the background. Um, and Maria, hello. Um, you have got some uh, questions for us, hopefully. Yes, there's quite a lot of questions that have come in, um, some statements as well. So I will um, try and keep them together. Um, so we're going to kick off with um, what has happened to the increased total tax take from landlords since Section 24 came in, and why is no one mentioning it? Uh, so there were some figures out not so long ago, um, uh, actually, and it has sig significantly um, taken in far more money uh, than it had envisaged. Um, and we will be talking about it in the context of our uh, fiscal research with LSE in the next few weeks. And Ben, that, that could encourage the government to look at this limited company route to avoid Section 24 if they think there's more tax to be uh, Get gained from from that. I I do regard that as a as a as a as a, a threat. Yeah, no, um, it is it, it is a threat, and uh, actually, I I'd probably be more worried if I had a holiday let Vanessa. Uh, to be honest with yeah. you. Uh, yeah, um, you're uh, right. 
because I think someone like Gove will want to encourage long-term sustainable renting. Mm. Um, uh, and uh, what we will be arguing, um, when the moment is right, um, uh, but you know, we are very clear that we see Section 24 as uh, a, you know, a pretty outrageous um, uh, 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 land grab. And you know, it's very clear from the figures that have only been out a couple of weeks, in fairness, that um, you know, the, the tax take home uh, was very, very significant. <laughs> the slight, slight problem is that we're all still here. Uh, uh, so, you know, the argument um, that, you know, landlords exit the sector in a meaningful way is not borne out off the back of this. So some exit, but yeah, as, as I said earlier, what we're seeing is a consolidation. So we have to think of some new arguments on on, on this one, frankly, but it, uh, it's not forgotten about. It's, uh, you know, it, I'm, I'm reminded um, uh, uh, every year of the pain that, that Section 24 uh, brings when I complete my tax return. So um, when the moment is right, we will bring that back into play. Yeah, I think you're right about um, holiday lets as well, um, Ben. I think there's a very strong possibility uh, that they will, as we talked about earlier on, on the call, uh, they yeah. will um, come under further taxation to deter landlords from taking up second homes uh, and holiday let locations where uh, local people can't afford to live and in fact that means very often you know talking from my experience in Cornwall recently um, there's a shortage of accommodation for local workers to service um, the hospitality industry so th this is a very real possibility I think holiday lets will, will come uh, under some former uh, more formal uh, taxation uh, uh, to deter them okay Maria next one please okay um this one is regeneration buy. Is there any indication that a tenant's right to buy their rented home might feature in Labour or Conservative, conservative Party policy? Uh, no, uh, I, I, I mean, I think at best, I mean, what I'd like to see actually is some sort of tax incentive for landlords to sell it to their tenants. Um, uh, but I don't think we'd ever be in a position. Uh, I mean, I, I actually sold one of my properties uh, a few years ago to my to my tenant, and it was great. They paid rent right up to the day of completion. Um, you know, it was it was you know they knew all of the things that were wrong with the property and kind of you know built that into the into the sales price. So I, I don't think we are going to be uh, have some sort of mandatory purchase here. I think it's probably good practice to ask your your tenant if you're thinking of selling. Would they be interested in talking shop about buying it? Um, uh, but I, I don't think that's on the political agenda, really. As I say, I'd like to turn it into a positive that um, uh, landlords get some sort of tax break uh, off the back of it. Cool. Right. We've had a few um, questions or comments about the uh, electrician. Um, mm. One has asked, does NAPIT do criminal background checks on electricians? I expect you probably don't know the answer to that, but it's interesting. Um, well, I, 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 sorry, I Vanessa, please. To, sorry, Ben, I was just going to say, I think they have to, don't they? If you're visiting, if you're visiting a consumer's home, you have to have some kind of background check, don't you? Uh, I believe that's the case. I don't know specifically about NAPIT, but the other thing I probably should have added, I think you know, if you've got an individual that is part of a uh, an approved or some sort of you know, regulatory body, then in the same way you've got you know, dodgy letting agents or or whatever, you know, I I I think actually you're reporting it to the organisation uh, if it's a company, you know, to to the organisation and then to the uh, the person that's regulated or the individual that's that being regulated, uh, so that they can take uh, uh, action if if needs be. I think that's a, a very good shout, and I should have said that earlier. Mm. That actually takes us on to a, another question on the same matter is should electricians have a better known professional register like gas safe? Um, I mean, when I think of electricians, I immediately think of NIC, IC or NAPIT, uh, actually. So I don't know that, uh, I mean, gas safe have kind of made that more recognizable from a consumer perspective but i do think that's one of the things in this instance that the the, the landlord actually could do um uh, is actually report the the, the concerns to their trade or, or professional membership body to which they belong i think that's quite a sensible thing to do okay 
Uh, so we've had a few on the utilities um, side of things. So someone has tenant in a HMO that has an electric scooter which he charges off and on um, but refuses to pay because he pays all inclusive rent. So any suggestions how to deal with that? I either have a fair use clause um, but I think if you've got uh, if you're contracted I don't think you can you know it's like saying where you, you need to unplug that TV that wasn't you know that wasn't part and parcel of it um, I find them very irritating those scooters by the way um, uh, uh, but I don't think there's much you can do in the, in that in that um, in that situation other than um, think a bit more creatively next time you rent it and perhaps you know when we're uh, vetting tenants going forwards perhaps we should ask uh, if they have an electric scooter or electric car or they're a very very heavy user of uh, broadband or you know because so many people working from home now and I know in our home we've got I don't know 12, 12 devices on the broadband because um, I have two two lodges in my home um, so it's amazing uh, you know, COVID has changed things quite dramatically and sped up some kind of trends that were already developing. Um, and this work from home uh, hybrid model that we're, we're probably seeing for the foreseeable future, it is greatly increasing uh, demand on the utilities, on the broadband. Uh, you know, these are all things to, to bear in mind, aren't they, Ben, um, for future tenant referencing? Have you got an electric scooter? <laughs> Yeah, I, I that's a new one on me. I uh, uh, that that uh, again had 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 passed me by. But I, I I think in this situation there isn't a great deal that can be done about it. But uh, you know, uh, learning from it from the uh, for 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 the future, either some sort of fair use clause or a, a an up to limit. But I, I guess it all depends on whether you can kind of associate the consumption to the you know uh, to the individual room. It's it's very very tricky. I think. You know, review the rent at the next opportunity. Mm. I was just going to add, um, there's a fantastic service called Look After My Bills, which you just sign up to once and then they automatically move you to the most um, competitive energy tariff every year. Uh, there's a landlord service that does it as well. Um, it's interesting, I logged on there the other day and they've actually shut it down because of um, the current crisis. So when it restarts that would definitely be something for landlords to look at to ensure that you're always getting the most uh you know competitive energy tariff and um, that that's i've been with them for about three years now they were actually on dragon's den i think they were the um highest awarded investment on dragon's den it is an actually br really brilliant service um so look out for that when it's back up and running just need to make sure we've got some energy supplies left vanessa quite <laughs> any more maria Oh, just on that, actually, my um, energy supply has just gone out of business. So um, we've been <laughs> hit yeah. by that exact thing. So we we were panicking, but it's it's been really well handled, actually. So, yeah. Well, I'll and send you a jacket potato in the in oh. <laughs> oil. How's that? <laughs> Thank you. Um, we've got a couple of questions about around EPCs. Um, One saying, hi, I'm looking at the EPCs on some of my houses. I favour Victorian houses and they all have condensing combi boilers, double glazing, LEL, loft insulation, etc. And according to the EPC, which is typically a D on solid wall property with these properties, the suggestion is internal or external wall in insulation. The cost is 4,000 to 14,000 with an annual saving of 111 pounds. Um, so uh, they're saying I'm not ruining my beautiful red brick with external insulation and internal insulation is a huge hassle, makes the room smaller and uh, they've lobbied the government to give points for smart meters so tenants use less electricity and gas. So I, I think a couple of things on this. Our, our, our research with um, Lacalis will be looking at hard to insulate properties, particularly uh, uh, older properties and properties that are back to back as well, where you have even more limited scope to uh, to, to do it. Um, honestly, I probably my own opinion I wouldn't for now I wouldn't touch it I would see what happens in relation to um, uh, provision for, for grants to be able to upgrade um, <laughs> uh, that that 
that said, it's probably not going to be the most aesthetic uh, 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 looking um, uh, piece of kit that you're going to have to comply with. It, it, my, my properties are a D, they're not Victorian, but but my properties are a D. Um, and I am very much in this, a very similar boat uh, to the, the, the individual that raised the query. I would sit tight for the moment and see how these things pan out. I, I certainly wouldn't be splashing 14 grand to save 100 quid a year i mean that's just bollocks isn't it dear oh dear i, I would i would add ben that this this uh commentator who's who's put this question onto the chat they're not alone um indeed there's quite a few discussions along these lines on on property tribes of uh you know we heard recently of of a landlord that was told to remove his triple glazed windows because they didn't fit with the, the property or something. I mean, just it's, it, it's actually quite ridiculous okay. in certain cases. Um, so just I would just say you're not alone. Go on to um, the forums, uh, go on to propertytribes.com um, and join with other landlords who are experiencing, experiencing the same thing as you. Um, and uh, as Ben says, hopefully there will be clarity around this issue uh, going forwards. And, and, and Vanessa, the, the, the research that we're doing is designed to specifically to answer uh, uh, or to address this issue, hmm. because you know I've uh, uh, seen a lot of the uh, the threads on PT, but there are a lot of landlords and, and property owners generally who are in the same boat, who would, hmm. you know, who understand what the direction of travel is, who, you know, think it's a good a good thing that we have greater energy efficient homes um but reducing room sizes and making your properties look you know but ugly uh you know i would prefer there to be an alternative solution and i would prefer it um uh, if there was some assistance um uh, uh alongside it because landlords cannot be expected to carry the can you know there are other areas of the economy that will will have to move um uh, to you know to a more carbon uh, efficient rating uh, and also i mean don't get me started but the actual epc measurement and the mechanism is mm. you know is is actually a load of crap as well uh, mm. and and it just really defies logic so we 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 want to be able to answer uh, the, the, the question more coherently than, than I have other than get very irritable about it but that's what I hope our, our, our research will, 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 will do and we'll obviously make sure that it's, uh, it's on the PT website as well. Thank you. Another uh, on that subject another one has um, suggested that the government should fund underfloor insulation um, because it helps with listed properties and properties in conservation areas and looks and works better than double glazing. Yeah, not, not a bad shout. I mean, my only worry about some of these types of um, uh, uh, activities is that it's going to be hugely disruptive, uh, you know, to do something like that or even, you know, wall insulation as well. And if we think about uh, you know what's coming down the, the 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 track in terms of tenure reform and uh, no section 21. We need to make sure that if there's a, a scenario where we need to do very significant work to the property, you know, to upgrade the property because of other government direction, that we in order to comply, we might need to move our tenant out or move our tenant along a little bit in order to do some very, very intrusive work. So this is where the various pieces of, of, of legislation will need to complement each other. And it is one of the uh, the grounds for repossession in our shadow white paper that was published about a month ago that, that we want to see um, uh, when Section 21 is abolished. Hmm. OK, well, I'm just looking at the time um, and we have had our hour. It's flown by um, and I do hope you've enjoyed the, the topics that, that we've covered. And thank you to everybody that joined in and asked questions. Um, Maria, I think I'm right in saying that there's no landlord lens in November. And then in December, I think it's on the 13th of December, um, Ben and I are going to host a kind of year in review of the top trending topics that got landlords talking, landlords engaged, landlords even riled up. Um, <laughs> and we will cover those uh, on the 13th of December. Um, have we got a time for that? Half past three. 
half past three. Okay, so a date for your diary, 13th of December, half past three for the final landlord lens of the year. Um, can I just remind everybody that we do have uh, the Property Investor Show coming up on the 15th and 16th of October at Excel in London, both myself and Ben will be there. It is the gathering of the property tribes. It's free to attend. It's a really great day out. So I do hope we see some of you in person there. But for now, thank you to everybody um, who's joined us on the call. Uh, thank you to Ben as well for being my co-host and for uh, Maria for helping with the questions and organizing today's event. Um, we're signing off now. We'll see you in December or hopefully in person at one of the, the property shows um, that's taking place across the UK over the next couple of months. But it's uh, bye-bye for now. Cheerio, folks. Bye, Ben.